And we are, as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Welcome to the Republic News Network live national broadcast. You may call me Kelby. Tonight I'll be acting as your moderator. It is June the 23rd, 2016, and tonight's RNN featured show is Connecting the Dots with Mr. Dan Apple. The RNN, which stands for the Republic News Network, has been doing this radio show for about six years, and it's always been a friendly introduction for the people of the United States Corporation. It's true, the United States is a federal corporation, and their exclusive jurisdiction lies within the District of Columbia. The Republic government was just a bunch of U.S. citizens that realized they wanted to be Americans, as our founders intended. We've been hard at work now for eight years and have successfully re-inhabited the original government vacated under Lincoln in 1861. I know, it's hard to understand. Don't worry. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans and very pro-government. You can consider that the Republic members are tired of all of the corruption that we see every day. See, we found in the law that there is, in fact, two forms of government here on our land and we did something about it. You can actually find this information under Title 28 Section 3002 and UCC 9-307H. See, we are people. We're mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. We have families just like you. We simply found some truth and now we're sharing these important truths with the rest of the world. So get ready to hear things that sound amazing. Get ready to understand that you too can be a part of history. We welcome each one of you to Connecting the Dots with Mr. Dan Happel and the Republic for the United States of America. Before we go into tonight's national broadcast, please bow your head in prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to get this information out to the people. Lord, bless this call. Guide us. Guide these guests that are coming on. Just help them to properly just connect the dots and help people to further their understanding of what really is going on in this nation, Lord. Keep us safe. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to yield the floor to Mr. Dan Happel. Dan? Uh, good evening to the folks uh, listening to our radio broadcast, Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. Tonight we have a couple of uh, really excellent guests on our show. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Wright, who is... Uh, 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 an author and uh, a very, very talented man by background in the communications and telecommunications and uh, intelligence areas, and uh, also a, a gentleman that uh, you've had on your show before, uh, and that is Bill Coate, who is a retired Marine colonel who was the uh, head of the intelligence training school at Quantico for the Marine Corps. And uh, tonight's show, we will be uh, connecting the dots. And uh, the dots we're going to try to connect tonight will be pulling our country back together, uh, bringing it back from the abyss, because, frankly, our country has changed so much. It's morphed so much over the last, well, really 100 years, but in truth, really in a bad way over the last... Uh, 15 or 20 years that uh, I think we we all recognize we've got to uh, do something to bring our country back from the brink or uh, we will lose the constitutional republic that we have. And uh, with that, I'm going to start the uh, program with a quote uh, from the policy statement by the United Nations Conference on Human Settlement, that's uh, Habitat One in Vancouver, B.C., in 1976. This goes back a ways. But this is agenda item number 10, and that is land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument uh, of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. 
If unchecked, it may became, become a major obstacle in the planning and the implementation of development schemes. Now, I think we recognize that uh, one of the primary planks of the Communist Manifesto is the destruction of private property, and uh, I'm going to kind of address that part of it uh, today uh, with this radio broadcast because that is such an integral part of our culture and our economy and our constitutional republic. And uh, with that said, uh, guys, I'd like to uh, start the discussion uh, with the uh, discussion uh, of the uh, growth of government at all levels, but mostly at the federal level, and the corresponding loss of personal liberty that goes with that. And uh, I guess, Jeff, I'd uh, start with you, and then, uh, Bill, if you'll kind of work into this discussion, we'll go from there. Yeah. Yes, well, good morning. Uh, it's very good to be on the show today. Um, I guess the first thing I'd start off with is a response to your quote. If anything, public land ownership is a, re is a recipe for poverty, uh, where private, private land ownership is a recipe for wealth production. And I think the, the sheer um, confusion uh, over how private property rights work is one of the many things that fundamentally have, uh, have made our population um, uh, virtually forget everything that went into uh, the settlement and development of this, this country. While, while no development of this nature has, has ever been perfect, and the market is not perfect, it definitely has uh, a much better uh, track record for increasing, taking people out of poverty and increasing their wealth. You know, having seven and a half billion people on the planet today, it's interesting to note uh, that right now, uh, multiple studies have concluded that the level, uh, the proportional level of poverty uh, in the 20th century through all of the fits and starts uh, has been reduced to about 10% uh, of the world being in extreme poverty, where at the beginning of the 20th century, it, uh, it started at about uh, 50% being in extreme poverty. Uh, that in and of itself, I think, is a track record that, uh, that anybody would have a hard time arguing with and shows that uh, the, uh, the myths and, and misdirections of the left um, can't overcome reality, no matter how hard they try. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, private property ownership. If you look at the Constitution of the Founders, one of the most important things was that people did have private property ownership. Um, I think it's ben Benjamin Franklin said that there's two critical pieces of freedom, and that's freedom of speech and private property ownership. And I would say that what we've seen is a vast erosion of both of those. Um, and, and I'd probably say that uh, that uh, the freedom of speech is, you know, is one of those things we've we spent uh, probably billions of dollars protecting the Second Amendment. But I think we've been so focused on that shiny mirror ball uh, hanging off the ceiling that we've we forgot that we've lost so many freedoms uh, and freedom of speech and that and that uh, because we have we've also lost this this thing we call private property ownership I think if you ask most people in America if they own their property they'd say yes but then again I, I ask them well then stop paying taxes on it if you if you own it because uh, you know the clothes on your back you own also but you don't pay taxes on them uh, every year correct and the, that's, and the that's right, Bill. And and one of the things that I, I think a lot of people don't relate to is the fact that private property is uh, what your what your mind, your ideas, your your uh, speech, everything is your property, your private property. And in the in the process of chasing, I guess uh, the concept that property has to be just a tangible goods, we forget that. Uh, everything uh, about us, including our personalities, our our thoughts, everything, are really our personal property. Mm -hmm. well, Jeff so and I had a, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
self ownership self ownership is the key you know it's it's uh, just for one ex one current example is uh, uh, people uh, don't understand a lot about the, the public lands transfer movement in this country because they don't understand this issue of private property. Uh, but if you take just one example, over in Harney County, Oregon, where the occupation took place at the refuge, uh, 30 years ago, Harney County, uh, on a per capita basis, was the most prosperous county in Oregon. The most prosperous. Uh, now, it ranks absolutely at the bottom since uh, they started closing off any private use of the public land uh, within Harney County. And that was one of the basis for the, uh, for the protest was the fact that the government is in the, if you look at rural counties, like particularly here in Idaho or anywhere uh, in, in the Mountain West, what you find is, is that uh, the rural counties, which were very prosperous 30, 40, 50 years ago, since the, the extreme intervention began in closing off of public lands uh, to uh, any private use whatsoever, whether it be extraction, uh, logging, uh, uh, cattle, and sheep grazing, uh, as they have successfully closed off those public lands, virtually all of those, those counties, uh, mine included, uh, have become uh, the poorest counties in, in Idaho and in the Western states. And so until you begin to, until you, you understand and get the general population to understand uh, the, the value of private property ownership and how it relates to health, uh, uh, health of the land, as well as uh, the prosperity of the land, you're not going to get anywhere in this discussion because we have a population that largely is bereft of understanding of how uh, economics works or they don't understand natural law. And this is something that um, uh, that we discussed, that Bill and I discussed the other day when we had our initial conversation, is to, uh, this lack of understanding is what we have to attack most directly because it is the education process of understanding uh, uh, private property, land ownership, fundamental rights, uh, natural law, and the economics that flow from it uh, that allow uh, the population to make the correct political decisions uh, and who they vote for, what issues they, they, where they stand on which issues and how they move forward. Without this education, we're lost as a, as a population, and it shows. Well, I, I totally agree, Jeff. And uh, the other thing is who controls the dialogue? You know, and how, how I'm just throwing it out as a question: Who controls the dialogue, and and how have we empowered them? Um, because the the dialogue, I think, is is largely controlled um, uh, in the political arena, not in the in the private arena. Well, I think I, it's, I, guys, I agree with that, and and I'm sorry, I'll introduce uh, introduce a quote here. Uh, 1933. It's uh, from the first Humanist Manifesto that was uh, published and co-authored by John Dewey. Uh, we know John Dewey is the father of modern progressive education, and a quote out of that is, uh, quote, education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism, and every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday schools meeting for an hour once a week, teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching. And he was promoting that, and that's unquote. Mm. So go ahead, guys. Mm. Well, that, well, that kind of – go ahead, Jeff. didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I think you take that – you know, control of the message is based on is, – I found is essentially based on, as, as any good propagandist knows, is control of the terms. And it, it starts right there with the explanation or the statement that you just made using the term humanist and humanism uh, and human rights. Okay, when you, once you start to, to, to pervert and distort language, it changes the essence of the message. If you, if you think about it for a moment, there is no such thing as human rights. There's only individual rights. Human rights is a collective idea where between uh, commonly humans hold between them 
certain rights that are supposedly not held by individuals, but that's a complete and utter fallacy. Only individuals hold rights. There are no collective rights. There are no special rights. And this is when you ask any person in the general population, even a lot of people that think that they're versed in these things, you'll find that they don't understand that how important the distinction is and cannot actually enunciate or, or speak to what their individual rights are or what their actual definition is. And I think this key, these are, each one of these are key in, in uh, misdirecting and redirecting the population into understanding things that are simply not true rather than what the truth is. Well, that, 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 that's spot on. I just, I think about our founders, you just think about the de uh, Declaration of Independence and what did, it, what did they say? That we had certain uh, unalienable rights and, and they came from God and not the government. And, and exactly what you said, Jeff, they came to the individual. They didn't come, they didn't come to the collective. And, uh, you know, as I've reviewed this and, and thought a lot about it, um, there's another thing, Dan, when you talked about uh, the public education, Dewey's quote, he said, you know, he, he basically came out in that quote and said that the school was the, the means to control and to educate children, and and the only other stopgap that might have been in there was the church, right? Because the church, the church is, and is, the family, yeah, and they're trying right. to they're trying to uh, really diss the uh, not only the church but the family. Yeah, absolutely, and they said, you know, he said, what can an hour of Sunday school do? And, and I would take that a step farther, and I'd say. 1954, the Johnson Amendment, when he put the churches, you know, we, we talk a lot about separation of church and state, but he put the churches basically under the state with the Johnson Amendment and the tax exemption 501c3 issue in an attempt to silence any opposition uh, uh, or voice in government uh, of the church. And, and I think you'd ask most pastors today, and they believe they can't talk about politics uh from the pulpit, so so the one stop gap that you had has has pretty much been silenced. And if you look back at our founding, and uh, you know our our country was founded in the church and from the pulpit, and and there was a, a degree of accountability to politicians and, and what they did that that we don't see today. We 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 talk about uh, political correctness. Um, political correctness is no more than controlling speech. <laughs> And uh, I mean, I, I think if you went out and asked half, to ask people, do you think that uh, that you have freedom of speech, that you can speak against uh, what you might uh, consider evils of going on in the nation? Most of them would be tell you they can't, and they're afraid to. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree, and I think that that fear of uh, of I guess retribution. Uh, for your political thoughts is uh, is carrying over not in, only in uh, the church but also the individuals. Jeff, did you uh, uh, have have you thoughts on that particular issue too? Uh, yes, it, it, it goes. It, the key is going to the understanding here again. It's 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 the same exact fundamental issue involved: the creation and the idea that group rights accrue to fictional entities such as corporations and therefore and, and the uh, and the co-opting of the church into the idea of being a nonprofit corporation immediately translates into the removal of rights uh, and and the granting to the state uh, of the ability to control any group through such things as group rights, such as the fiction of corporate personhood. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people uh, uh, applauded in the, in the conservative movement, the Citizens United, because it supposedly freed up speech. But what they didn't realize at the same time is it took a whole bunch of their rights away. And I think people are beginning to realize that right now, that when you, uh, when you grant these fake rights, these fake group rights, uh, such as corporate personhood, uh, when uh, as a fictional device, in order to gain control of, of the church groups themselves, 
you exclude each individual member's right, fundamental rights in that group. And, that's, and now you see that the churches are controlled through this entity of nonprofit uh, uh, 501c3 or, or organization, uh, which, which is literally destroying their, their original ability of free association and the ability to speak their mind on any issue within the confines of their church whether it be political, whether it be cultural, no matter what it is. This is, this is it, again, it's one of the, the key and fundamental things that, that's happened in our culture and in our political system that is literally destroying individual rights as, as it continues. It, it, you know, I, man, that's, that's brilliant, Jeff. I, I, uh, I look at this and I say, well, where is the op- opposition voice to the direction that our country is going? Where's the strong, where, where can you network the, the biggest group of people uh, and make them activists towards freedom instead of, you know, uh, co-opted sheep to just, you know, uh, be blindly, you know, led to the edge of the, the abyss. I, it, I, and so my question, Dan and, and Jeff, would be what is the opposition voice out there to what we see the destruction of our individual rights and freedom and, and liberty. If the church is silent, then, then, then where, the, where is the, the opposition voice? Well, my comment on that uh, would be the, uh, the family, but Jeff, um, I, I would say too, that's one reason that we're, uh, uh, we're losing the, the focus on family relationships are our families are literally falling apart and i think that's been planned well it's it's another outgrowth of of uh the, the other device uh that began at the early part of the 20th century in the income tax it was not only did the recognition of uh of corporations uh begin with the turn of the 20th century but the imposition of the, of the individual income tax uh unconstitutionally uh, was the key was the key factor gaining control of the family uh, through through this idea that you get to tax somebody's individual wealth and, and labor production and uh, um, all these things uh, e- even though they seem to be disconnected um, in in both time um, and implementation they actually work very much together to gain complete control through different uh, different mechanisms of the family, of the church, of the community. Uh, because regardless of whether uh, a, a person happens to be, uh, happens to have a theological view, a spiritual view of the universe, or a cosmological view, it is simply a fact that community begins for the majority of people uh, through the church, then the family, uh, through the family, then the church, then the community, uh, and, and upward through the political system. So if you gain, if you gain control of those entities at the very lowest level uh, of the system, you gain control throughout the whole system, and that's exactly what's happened. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and I, uh, I, I've got another quote here, and I, I, I'm, I'm full of quotes today, but uh, 1928, this is a book by H.G. Uh, Wells, as we now well know as a... Uh, uh, Fabian Socialist, uh, who was an extremely popular writer and author in the early part of, uh, of the 20th century. The book is called The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution. And uh, the quote is, uh, quote, the political world of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, and supersede existing governments. The open conspiracy is the natural inheritor of socialist and communist enthusiasms. It may, in, it may be in control of Moscow before it is control of New York. The character of the open conspiracy will now be plainly displayed. It will be a world religion. Uh, unquote. When was, when was that, Dan? That was 1928, and uh, so Jeff, your comments about it going back to the uh, to the income tax in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, th- this stuff's been uh, in the works for a very long time, and I think a lot of people focus on maybe the last 10, 20 
years as being really a, a big change in our culture, but it's been it's been in the works for a long time. And John Dewey was turn of the century, early early part of the 20th century. So, um, oh, you know, this it, is. It's a very, yeah, it's a very goal, important. So. It's a very important piece of what has become, uh, what has become the background, um, uh, euphemistically referred to or, or identified by most people as a as a normalcy bias. Um, yeah. what, is, what has happened is is that we now have generations that are born into uh, a system, and each generation that's born into a, a system automatically grows to accept the system that's in place uh, when they're there thinking it's normal. However, it, when, you, when you look between, when you look over successive generations since the turn of the 20th century, you can see just how clearly this shift in, in understanding and, and, um, and thinking uh, from an individual rights perspective to a collective rights perspective and all the political correctness that has now come with it is, is a key and essential feature. Most people have, have given up their, uh, their rights without even knowing it, and they give them up today without even knowing it. I mean, look at the decision we just got, uh, we just got this week. We get, we get hit from the left and the right by the Supreme Court. Uh, this week, we got hit from the right in a decision that basically says that police can make illegal stops and collect evidence, and that's okay. It doesn't matter. They can make a completely illegal stop, uh, demand somebody's ID, produce that ID, find an outstanding warrant, use that warrant, a traffic warrant, use that traffic warrant to then engage in the search and come up with evidence in order to convict the person. Now, whether, regardless of whether the, the, the person is under suspicion for drug, uh, uh, for drug dealing, or some other crime, the idea that any citizen on the street can now be stopped by a policeman and their ID demanded and use any pretext whatsoever to search their home, their car, as part of, of some uh, uh, impromptu investigation, it's just crazy. And yet people are going to accept it because they're going to say, well, the Supreme Court said so, and look where that gets us. Well, and that's, well, that's really, that's pretty key, I think, when you look at the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution and our Bill of Rights. Um, it, it takes away any protection you have of your, your personal, you know, your personal space. And, and people knowingly walk away from that, like you say, Jeff, because they said the Supreme Court said it. But just because the Supreme Court makes a ju uh, judgment um, you know, in our system of government, they were never authorized to, to write laws. Right, and they've changed their focus from being uh, interpreters of the Constitution, which was the original intent of the Supreme Court, to being uh, judicial a activists, and now they're uh, actually kind of legislating from the bench, and that's been the case for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I think that it's important what Jeff brought up just to talk about the Fourth Amendment a little bit because we know about the collection of uh, phone calls, emails, texts, uh, whatever, the collection of it um, by the government. And if, I, if I'm getting off base here a little bit, Dan, pull me back in. But uh, recently there's been a lot of talk about moving to a digital currency uh, in Europe, they want to get rid of the 500 euro note because they said uh, because of crime, and get rid of the hundred dollar bill in the United States because of crime. But you know, most crime in the United States is, all occurs at the you know twenty dollar bill level or lower. It's not it's not the hundred dollar bill, but it's this normalcy bias that Jeff was talking about. If you get people used to the fact of you know continue to to uh, get rid of paper money and and everything becomes digital. If you look at if you look at technology on on your cell phone text uh, email and then you look at uh, if the government goes to digital currency at that point you have nothing that at all that you're secure in you've lost all anonymity uh, in your life 
Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And and Jeff, I you had uh, you and I had a really good discussion about this uh, uh, probably a month ago, uh, talking about digital currency because at the point where they can control everything with computers with keystrokes. Uh, and there really isn't any uh, definitive oversight of the people controlling that system. We've completely lost control of our entire, uh, not only our financial system, but everything about our culture. Dan, forgive the intrusion. We're going to do a quick station identifier. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you and welcome you to uh, coming to these national broadcasts uh, week in and week out. We do hold these calls Thursday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, but we want to point out that uh, we do hold a Wednesday evening radio broadcast called Building the States. You can actually go to uh, uh, www.republicfortheunitedstates.org. Again, republicfortheunitedstates.org. And get all the information as to the conference line and or uh, uh, the links for the, for the live uh, radio broadcast. But it's very important for us to understand that we need to be at our county by county, uh, city by city, starting to re-inhabit those de jure vacated spots um, and, and so that we can develop the republic on a local level. The most important thing for us is to do as our founders intended, which is to stop sitting back and watching others fulfill these roles and pretending to operate a de jure national republic and when in fact it is a corporation. Dan, once again, I uh, apologize for the interruption. Um, Jeff, uh, I yield the floor to you. Uh, Dan did have a question. Well, like uh, like every like every tool, uh, there's uh, there's good and bad associated with the tool. Uh, in the wrong hands, uh, digital currencies uh, can be an extremely bad thing and allow further centralized control. However, if you look like uh, if you look at examples like uh, M-Pesa and uh, and Paga, um, uh, those applications. Uh, uh, which is a it's a it's a form of uh, of digital currency based on on cell phone minutes. Uh, and if you look at those applications that are totally decentralized, uh, they actually become tools of freedom because there is no central authority to those forms and things like Bitcoin. That's one of the these things frighten uh, frighten central bankers and and governments to death. And that's why they're trying to get out in front and create their own that are centrally controlled, so that uh, so that the the distributed forms cannot proliferate. But we're going to find that I think more and more people are going to uh, adopt the model of distributed currencies and uh, distributed cyber currencies and non-centralized uh, uh, types of electronic digital currency that will preclude central control. So. And, and, but through this, we're going to see every effort you possibly can. The, uh, uh, the attacks against the, uh, uh, the incorporation system in Panama a few months back, and, and you're going to see those pick up and continue. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to frame them as uh, the power elite trying to hide uh, their assets and, and, and so forth. But what you actually find out is there's hundreds of thousands of, uh, of small business individuals who use those same forms uh, to do completely legitimate business across international boundaries uh, and, and simplify uh, that work while remaining retaining their privacy. And that's why these attacks have begun on such structures because uh, what, the, what the governments don't like and what the, what the elites actually don't like uh, is the fact that the small individual uh, businessmen and individuals themselves can, can create their own structures through these different tools and applications that are now beginning to proliferate through uh, the internet and as uh, special application technologies. They're beginning to proliferate all over the place and they can't control them and this is what scares them. And that's why I, I encourage people uh, to start learning about all these alternative and cyber cash and, and, and um, uh, uh, cyber secure uh, currencies and exchange methods, because as this, as the financial, uh, the international financial re regime and the central banking system begins its breakdown, you're going to find it absolutely essential for people to begin to move uh, their wealth and protect their wealth uh, from that collapse uh, of the centralized system. Uh, to these secure, independent, and distributed systems that offer much more protection 
and much more much more efficient forms of transfer uh, completely out of the control of the government. What I like to say at this point is most central governments, most central corporate or banking systems or the like are all dead men walking and they don't even realize it. I think a lot of them realize it too, Jeff, and uh, the reality is they're trying to uh, trying to keep people from looking behind the curtain. And I, I think of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Act, the way it was kind of slight of hand in the, the uh, meeting on Jekyll Island, Georgia, uh, how that was couched as being taking uh, control away from the evil bankers and putting it in the hands of the citizens, when in fact it was doing the exact opposite, which is exactly what you're saying about the the Panama uh, situation. Mm. Hey, can I go back to something that just as I listened to uh, you and Jeff, uh, Dan, I when. Uh, Jeff's talking about this collective mentality, and we talk about uh, freedoms and lots of freedoms. Would you would you agree or disagree that we have become so collective in our political force in the, both the Democrat and Republican Party? Individuals identify themselves more as as a as a collective, and and uh, we've kind of moved away from a. Uh, uh, we've we've lost the sovereignty of the individual and the government because we don't have a lot of uh, choices in the political realm, and we can only identify as one collective or the other. Uh, yeah, I I uh, I agree uh, with you on that, Bill, because we we've talked about that before. But uh, progressive socialists have been in control of both political parties in uh, for, for almost a hundred years or over a hundred years and mm -hmm. uh, the the reality is is that uh, we no longer have a government of by and for the people it's now a government uh, pretty much controlled for the collective mm -hmm. oh absolutely this is uh, this is this is the key and fundamental thing I think we're trying to um, uh, get even even the the staunchest constitutional conservatives that you find today, um, they it, almost immediately when the right subject comes up, they fall out of the individual mode and move directly to the collective mode because they haven't even fundamentally understood the transition, and they haven't and they they haven't mentally trained themselves to be constantly on guard and to question those collective those collectivist type of uh, of operating methods. That are both that are used by both parties, and I think this combined with a lot of great big gaps in the education system uh, about the objective nature of history rather than the ideological nature of history, which is taught by both sides. One side simply can, teaches the conservative ideology, ideological view of history; the other side teaches the liberal ideological view. Um, we don't look at our history. Uh, objectively, this was brought home to me recently by a, a, a book uh, that I've read a couple of times, and uh, by uh, James Bradley uh, called Imperial Cruise, and it discusses, you know, if you talk to most Republicans or conservatives, uh, they look very favorably upon Theodore Roosevelt, except when you look behind the covers of what his administration did. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, He's almost he's almost as bad as is Richard Nixon, in uh, um, who we got the Environmental Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, uh, and who we got who took us off of the gold standard. I mean, did a whole horrid list of of things that have set in place the current system that is falling apart on us. And you go back uh, another uh, 70 years, and you find that Teddy Roosevelt, another icon of the Republican Party. Uh, was the one that initiated this idea of new nationalism and progressivism that Woodrow Wilson and, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, built on his own, you know, his own cousin. They built on although of being a Democrat. They built on these progressive ideas that Theodore Roosevelt himself was uh, in charge of doing and was the one that set up the 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 imperial power. Uh, expansion of the United States and gave us uh, gave us the public lands acquisition through mm -hmm. executive fiat. I mean, it, it's people have to first recognize that if they're going to 
that not only this do they have to understand, they have to look objectively at their history and not ideologically as they've been trained. And they have to criticize, criticize, criti or critique and critique, not to not just to criticize, but to actually question. You know, there's I love that that bumper sticker you see out there called question authority. We have an entire population trained not to do that at all. And it's it's one of our biggest downfalls. They just simply accept, as we talked about earlier, with this normalcy bias, what is, and they don't realize how far we've moved from what we were supposed to be and what we were for a period of time into what we are today, which is a huge population of sheep that just simply follow along and adopt either the left view or the right view, but are which are both are false views. Right, right. Well, I, I find it interesting that in 2008, uh, Hillary Clinton and John McCain both, when asked who their uh, ideal president was, they both referred to Teddy Roosevelt, who was the first progressive socialist president we had. So that shows uh, right there where the uh, the leadership of both parties are, are focused. It's progressive socialism. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would we, what will we tell the average citizen to do? Because I agree with Jeff. I think that uh, critical thinking has become a something of the past, and we've trained the collective on the right and left just to be critics. So so all they do is criticize, but they they don't apply any critical thinking. But how would how would you, Dan or Jeff? How would you tell the average citizen, you know, in order to to reestablish our republic or to put the sovereignty back in the people in, instead of the government, what would be the, what would be keys to uh, moving in that direction? I mean, because if we're if we're entrapped by a two-party system that that, as both of you have pointed out, is really is the same at the top, so they're they're going to the same uh, progressive socialism uh, uh, agenda. You know, where do we start changing things in our nation? I, I have some thoughts, but I just wanted to kind yeah. of throw that well, out. I, you know, and I, my own personal feeling on that is by being part of programs like Connecting the Dots, we need to expose that the emperor has no clothes. We need to expose the uh, the snakes, uh, the evil people that are in our very top levels of leadership, and how they have taken us down the wrong path and. I think uh, an expose is the best way to get people to start to think because it, in, unless they see some pain there, unless they see uh, something that is taking away all their rights, uh, their, the normalcy bias that Jeff referred to is absolutely part of our culture now. So I think it's going to take a shock treatment. Jeff, do you kind of agree with that? Well, in in, um, in chapter seven and eight, and then the last uh, third of the book, I, I explain the human behavior parts in chapter seven and eight, and what the the basic rules that people fall follow um, in 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 falling into these boxes. And then in the last third, in the chapter fourteen on, I explain the solutions. And the solution is the same as it's always been. Uh, it's building a better citizen, and and it starts with. Uh, that don't stop buying in. People have to learn, and, and they don't realize how unconsciously they buy in when they when they hear something or they see something. Uh, how many times have you heard when something's happening and you heard another conservative say, "Well, gee, there ought to be a law against that." Well, yeah. that's the first level. There's the first level of buy-in right there. Okay, they bought into this idea that you can fix a problem uh, uh, with government with another law. Well, we have, we have, what, 20 million laws in this country, and they haven't fixed anything. They've made a whole lot of things worse. And so the first part is simply to get each individual to recognize that they are an individual, to understand what that means as a citizen of the United States, what it means to be an individual and what their individual rights are, and to stop buying in to everything that they, they hear. People are, are, are so easily misdirected uh, these days because... They don't have, they, they, they really don't have formed personalities. They're not individuals. 
They are they are they have been trained and taught, and they have to learn how to break out or deprogram uh, themselves first. And it just simply starts by saying, I don't. No matter what they hear, where they hear it. You know, I taught my sons from a very early age uh, to believe nothing that they hear, only some of what they observe, and uh, and only and only what they completely understand and know. And if you follow those three basic rules, you'll find all of a sudden that you start questioning uh, virtually everything uh, as to the nature of the system and, and differentiating between what is reality and what is, and what is virtuality and what is false. And only in, when people can do that can we begin to regain control. But it can be done by each and every individual. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners on your program have already started that process but it takes a conscious ongoing effort uh, to stop following these, these, these bad group behavior uh, and, and become an individual again, which everybody thinks they are, but when they, if you really get them to self-examine and self-evaluate, they find out, no, they aren't. Well, and I, I'm going to make a comment here, too, that you guys, uh, if anybody tries to accuse uh, either you, Jeff, or, or Bill, of being uh, part of a conspiracy group. Uh, read your resumes. Folks, get on the, our website and take a look at these uh, gentlemen's resumes. These are two of the solidest patriot uh, that we could possibly have on our program. And I'm, I'm absolutely tickled to have people of your caliber uh, talking about these subjects because you fully understand how much we have lost, and, and you're standing up saying we've got to turn that around. And, and uh, uh, Bill, y- your comment on, on uh, things that you've seen, the, the uh, changes over the years, one of the things that uh, you talk about quite a bit is uh, how we have changed our culture from a Christian culture to a, uh, a kind of a sectarian culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, like Jeff says, all this is is a subtle change, but um, what I see in America right now is I see uh, a, a group of people that want uh, to restore the country and then a larger group of the people that believe there's no hope. But in my lifetime, I've never seen uh, people as concerned about what's going on as they are today. And so I keep keep going back to this thought of rather than um, just defining the problem, you know, uh, the solution. And and as I look at the Constitution, I think the solution is uh, in state government and not in the federal government. The solution is having strong leadership that says, you know, federal government, these are the 18 powers we gave you in in, uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And, oh, by the way, you know they don't they don't apply to our state or we we opt out or we nullify or something but i i think it's just my theory that the turnaround is really going to happen if it's going to if it's going to happen at all it's going to happen at the state level uh, where we're reassert uh, uh the republican form of government in the states that's that's 100 that's 100 percent correct that's that's it's something that I've been working on for a decade now. Some of the most ignorant constitution, constitutionally illiterate people that you find exist in state legislatures, county commissions, and local government. Uh, and until and until we find a better uh, a better um, uh, model of candidate that we put into those local and state offices, uh, it's going to be difficult to to do that change. But that's where it's absolutely essential, and that only comes from building a better citizenry. And, and themselves building that citizenry. But we have to get, uh, you know, I found uh, here in Idaho or in Colorado, or I've worked in about five different states, and I found that, you know, there's, there's probably maybe 10 to 15 percent of the legislature, legislators actually have, in the House and the Senate, actually have uh, a fairly decent understanding of the Constitution and the Declaration, and they understand the difference between uh, self evident uh, and what isn't self-evident, and I think that um, uh, we have to build out from that core 
uh, more and more in order to affect these changes. And until we, we get some, uh, uh, some really some, some gonads into the state legislatures, it's going to be an uphill climb. But that's where it has to happen. It's got to happen at the local and state level. It's never going to happen at this point uh, at the federal level. One, because it's mathematically gone with regard to the, the fiscal uh, implosion. Uh, and two, there's no incentive at that level because there's no real control over the government 2,500 miles away. Okay, let me be really controversial here and irritate many people. Um, uh, can you change a system that's designed to control in a two-party system? Can you can you make those affect those kind of changes within parties or be? be because my theory is, is as long as you continue to be a part, a party person, then they have you right where they want you, and that re, and that that refers back to where you say about ten or fifteen percent of the people truly understand the uh, the constitution. And what I see in most uh, state governments is that uh, uh, that that's not enough power by staying within that party system to actually affect the kind of changes because I think we're I think we're past the time uh, where where we can look for gradual uh, uh, systematic change and it's a time time I think in our country where we need to to take a hard look and make drastic changes if we're not if we're not going to fall off the abyss because if you can if you compare the United States historically with every nation that has had its downfall you know we're we're not on par with them, I think we'll pass that point. And I, and I would I would tend to agree that that's that it's going to be difficult. I, I equate this very often to uh, trying to uh, disassemble a seven uh, a seven uh, fifty or seven fifty seven into a seven eighty seven Dreamliner while it's in flight. And this is extremely difficult to do. Uh, but I think. It's going to be a combination of both through the parties and outside the parties. I've been in the party, in the Republican Party, for uh, pretty much for the last 40 years. Uh, most of that time, uh, I've been in the Republican Party. Uh, however, the Republican Party left me quite a while ago, uh, and so I've continued to work uh, out basically from the perspective of being outside the party while being a member of the party and working actively in the party because I, I think the only way we'll do it is, is using all the tools that we have in the tool bag. I would I would agree with that, Jeff, and, and of course, Bill, you know my uh, situation. I actually ran for the state chair of the Montana GOP last year and uh, narrowly lost that one but we uh, I'm, I'm still very involved with the uh, Montana GOP not because I agree with all of the things that they're doing but uh, I think that uh, just like Jeff you're referring to uh, trying to reassemble a uh, uh, 757 into a 7 uh, 67 uh, in flight, I think what we need to do inside the party is to put more uh, good, solid constitutional conservatives in positions of leadership, and if they beat you the first time, just keep going back until you finally prevail. And we have we have in Montana, and I'll use this as an example, um, in 2008, we had a caucus vote in Montana. Forty percent of the caucus vote went for Ron Paul. Uh, Mitt Romney won that caucus vote by just a very, very narrow margin. But yet when uh, we went to the uh, uh, convention, uh, zero delegates were elected for Ron Paul. Uh, this year, we had, out of our 24 delegates, we had 18 that were constitutional conservatives that were elected uh, to go to the national convention in Cleveland. Now, that's a sea change uh, shift in, uh, the, in the party, and I think, you know, sometimes we're a little bit too impatient. I think we, we have to recognize that if we have the persistence that the Democrats 
and the progressives have had, uh, we can prevail. We can't expect it overnight, but we can prevail, and there will be enough of us there that if it all does fall apart, we can help to pull it back together. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I just, you know, and I bring that up because I see more and more people completely disconnecting uh, uh, from the parties because, uh, like you said, Jeff, the, the party left you a long time ago, and I see more and more people feeling that way and feeling like they don't have a choice in politics, so they continue to disconnect rather to, than to engage. Uh, I just throw that out. That's, that's, that's what I see with the average uh, citizen out there. Well, at this, at this point, at this point, I, I, you know, I understand it implicitly what, what you're saying. Um, but as I said, is, is uh, the necessity we have, things are so direly, deeply in trouble at this point uh, that we need to explore and use every tool at our disposal. And, mm -hmm. and at least for some period of time, until there's a more general shift in the, in the larger population, uh, we're going to be hung into uh, having to use the, the party vehicle, if you will, uh, in order to get some of this, some of this, uh, um, these items accomplished. But I think more and more what you're going to see in the young people coming up is definitely going to be a disconnect from, uh, from those groups and start operating largely independently, um, at least on the conservative side. Now, we got a real problem there to deal with, obviously. Uh, in, uh, in the fact that a lot of, there's so many young people that are, are so completely um, inculcated or in, in, in propagandized into, uh, into this collective mindset, uh, we've, we've got a large, a large problem there to deal with. But I think, I, I think we can, that it's going to be the, the kids right now, the 30 and under millennials and the ones that follow that are really, that do have this independent streak that may be quite even larger uh, than the independent streak in our generation by far uh, that are going to mm -hmm. be the, the, the fouts of this. I'm, I'm a little bit encouraged as much by the Sanders movement. Now, we're going to see after the convention, uh, uh, even if their ideas are wrong, I think their, um, uh, their basic methodology of disconnecting from the Democratic Party uh, is just as important as the view that we represent here for the Republican Party, that people begin need to become more independent and to disconnect from party politics and start concentrating independently on how to change the system. Yeah, here, here. Yeah. I agree with I, that. I agree with that, and I think, too, Jeff, we need to uh, make sure that uh, the one thing we stress is that they have to stay engaged. They have to stay involved. We can't allow people to walk away and say, well, I've, I've given up, because at that point, if you're not in the game, you know that the, the other team's an automatic winner. Well, when I, began down, when I began down this road 30 years ago, I should have given up, I should have given up then uh, if I took that view, and I've been on this path now for 30 years, and I, I, I have as much commitment today as the day I started down this path. Yeah, here, here. I am too, the same way. So, Bill, um, your your uh, your comments about the Republican Party, and I know you've had some real heartburn with uh, some of the things that have happened in the party, and frankly, I have too. Uh, but uh, I I would like to see people like you uh, taking a stronger role in the local. Uh, party politics because, frankly, you can have a huge impact on uh, local people because so many people have so much respect for you. Well, I think that, that's actually very flattering. I, You know, people often ask me, though, they say, are uh, uh, you a Republican or a Libertarian? And I tell them, no, I'm just an American. Uh, and uh, I just have such a hard time identifying uh, with with the parties because um, I I think that I think that what we do is we play in the same playing field and I don't disagree with you or Jeff being involved I think that's I think that's phenomenal I but here's what I think is that as long as we uh, Sun Tzu uh, is something that we studied as you know officers and in, in the Marine Corps and 
he always said to to know your enemy and to know yourself, and these are just three little things, and and to attack the enemy where where he isn't. And my my whole thesis is that we continue to go back and play on the same playing field that they have designed and controlled for, oh, I don't know, you know, a hundred years, and and so until we decide or we plan or we figure a way to um, take the power away from uh, the power elites that we won't change anything. Um, because it's, it's kind of like taking down an insurgency. Um, you take away their power to operate. You don't, you know, when, in the military, you know, if we would go to war somewhere, the, the idea was not to go in there and kill and capture everybody. The idea was to get the people to give up before before you showed up. So you use this combination of psychological warfare and information operations um, um, on the people. But, you know, you, you contrast that to if I continue to play on the uh, on fight in the battlefield that they have designed, I'm going to continue to lose because because they're holding me exactly where they want me. They're going to give me a little bit of victory to keep me fighting, but they're not going to ever let me uh, fundamentally uh, dethrone them. Does that make sense? It it uh, it does, and I, I hate to say this, we're at the end of our hour, and okay. that is an excellent place to leave this discussion with the idea that uh, hopefully both of you gentlemen will come back and we can uh, pursue that uh, discussion uh, down that path at a later date. Uh, and with that said, I'd like to uh, give each of you gentlemen an opportunity to discuss briefly your books, uh, some of the things that you're actively involved in, any websites and so forth. And uh, and then we'll uh, uh, we'll drop drop it from there. So, uh, gentlemen, first of all, uh, Jeff, would you like to talk about the Citizens Last Stand? Uh, sure. And, and and real quickly, they can anybody that goes to the citizenslaststand.com. Uh, that's my blog site. I also have uh, about 60 or 70 uh, articles on there discussing all kinds of topics at the citizenslaststand.com. Uh, anybody that's interested in purchasing the book uh, can go to uh, Amazon.com and simply plug in the Citizens Last Stand and it'll pop right up. I'm working on my next book right now, which discusses uh, all of these things that we're talking about here today, and I hope to have that out early next year. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, Bill, good. would you like to tell people about your book? Well, sure, Dan. I just I, I wrote this. I, I did the research, and uh, it was the idea behind it was just to get people to stir, stir it up and, uh, like we've talked about, just start thinking things uh, through critically for themselves. Could have written an encyclopedia, but I realized we live in an information age, so I was trying to put something together that takes you about two hours to read. And uh, if nothing else, it, it should make you question and uh, become a critical thinker, I guess, rather than a, than a critic. But uh, I really appreciate having having me on, Dan. Uh, Thanks for this opportunity, and I would be happy to come back at any time. Well, you guys are great, great guests, uh, very knowledgeable people, and uh, also, in in my mind, two of the best patriots we've got in our country. And frankly, we're at a point right now where that patriotism is at a premium. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being part of our program, and uh, I want to thank our, our uh, guests on the radio to uh, – uh, the Connecting the Dots uh, radio program. Uh, next week we'll have another interesting program for you, and frankly uh, we're going to try to pursue this public land issue uh, a little bit further down, uh, down that path. So uh, please uh, join us again next week, and with that, uh, Kelby, I'll turn the uh, broadcast over to you. Thank you, Dan. That's going to conclude the show for today at the Republic News Network. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we went a little bit long tonight, um, so God bless. Good night. We'll see you next Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Bye-bye.